Hi, Paul Beckwith, uh, part-time professor, University of Ottawa, Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. Um, I'm going to I'm continuing my mishmash of uh, AGU topics. Although each of these videos can be watched, um, you know, in any order, doesn't really matter. This is the order in which I viewed things. So, I there was um, multiple um, talks on remote sensing of sea ice that I went to. So. We have ice boys that are floating around in the Arctic and they have radar reflectors. So the satellite data can be used. We, we have GPSs on these um, boys. We know exactly where they are. And, and because they have radar reflectors, they can now be detected from satellites. So we can use them to ground truth the, uh, the, 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 the satellite data. Um, and we could also, so if the satellite's measuring, say, uh, you know, thickness of the sea ice at a buoy, we can know, we can get a direct measurement of that buoy and compare them and see how well the satellite's doing, for example. Ground truthing is very important um, because we have to make sure we're interpreting the satellite data correctly. I did a video a while ago about how salt plays a huge role in um, measurements of sea ice thickness and it was throwing off the results and needed to, we needed to correct for salt. Um, so we know we know that the sea ice is thinning and breaking. Um, there's certain frequencies from the satellite C band, um, joint active and passive satellites. Uh, so different polarizations of the light can be used also in the detection. Um, any any active satellite is sending a signal out. So those would be radar satellites, for example. Any passive satellite is just measuring what reflects the light that reflects off from the ice. So you'd need the sun above the horizon and, and hitting the ice and you're measuring the, the, the light coming back reflecting from the ice. That would be a passive. Anything passive, a passive satellite detector is not sending out any signal, it's just detecting. So we're trying to get more accurate sea ice info, of course, as the ice degrades. It's going fast. so. There's different algorithms, uh, you know, to look at the radar SAT-2 data, Sentinel-1 data, trying to get the ice concentration. As the ice is thinning, of course, the ice is getting wetter. And uh, this changes the physical properties of the ice, and, and we have to correct for that with the sensors. Um, so first year and multi-year ice is actually tracked very well, but not deep in the summer melt. So the accuracy of these sensors decreases as you go, as you get deeper and deeper into summer melt towards, uh, you know, late August, September, because the ice is a lot wetter and the properties are, are different. Um, so thin ice, less than 30 centimeters thick. So that ice is along the ice edge, it's along coast. It's a real challenge to measure that ice accurately um, because for these reasons that there's a lot of water in the ice. So there's, there's a lot of work being done to try to improve the um, improve that number um, and uh, there's something called the coefficient of variation that is discussed to try to determine you know how much water is in the ice um, how much you know uh, like like we have to be able to separate water from from gre so-called grease ice which is new ice okay in like very new ice as soon as the water uh, start surfaces, there's no ice, the water starts freezing, very, very thin layer of ice. It looks kind of greasy from a distance, so that's grease ice. So we need to separate the water from that gre grease ice in the synthetic aperture radar, SAR data. Um, so there's different work on polarization uh, ratios and things to um, polarization ratio, ice concentration, for example. Um, different techniques to try to make sure we're resolving that because that's important for the sea ice extent numbers, for example, or the area numbers, um, of, uh, which are very important to know as we, um, well, it's all going quickly, so is it so important to know? Uh, I think it is. Um, there, there, there's, uh, so there's different sensors. There's optical sensors, there's radar, radar altimeter sensors, there's laser altimeters, there's microwave radars, and then there's something called synthetic aperture radar. So all of these things can be done. Um, there was some chi a Chinese study. There was some work at Bremen done. I mean, we're losing the extent of the ice. It's minus 12.7% per decade. That's over multiple decades. Although that's very fast, the, the um, loss of snow cover 
um, over the Arctic region is faster. It's about minus 22, 23% per decade over the last number of decades. That's in, in, in spring snow cover, June, July. Um, the sea ice thickness dropping about 0.58 uh, plus or minus 0 0.07, that's the error meters per decade. So the, you know, as we know the ice is getting quickly thinning. Uh, look at Peter Wadhams' work, look at his book, um, A Farewell to Ice. Um, so the Bremen talk talked about some of the details of the visible, the trade-offs. We've got visible sensors, thermal infrared sensors, those are just detecting heat, and we've got passive microwaves. So the idea is to combine the data from all of those three. Each one individually has trade-offs. So the visible would be, say, Landsat 8, um, um, peaking in the green, 540 nanometers. It's got a 30-meter resolution, so it's pretty fine resolution, um, but it's only regional because you can't scan, you can't, the resolution's so high you can't scan over the whole Arctic. You need the sun, you're looking at the reflectance, and you need uh, no clouds, clouds block it. The thermal infrared is the infrared, you're looking at heat, it's like one of those heat guns, you know, infrared heat guns where you see the different colors, uh, different colors and you shine it at your body, different temperatures. It's MODIS, so the MODIS is the thermal infrared. Um, it measures the ice surface temperature, um, it's got a one kilometer resolution, so you can, it, you can get images Arctic wide, um, you 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 uh, you don't need the sun. You're looking at the heat coming from the ice surface, and if there's clouds, though, they block it. It's no good with clouds. And then the, you have the PMW, which is passive microwave. This is the ASI or AMSR satellite is the acronym. Forget the acronyms. So it's microwave frequencies. It's like taking the the, the klystron from your microwave oven and pointing it. You know, you're measuring that frequency coming up. Um, and it's passive. Okay, so you're just looking at the microwaves coming up. Uh, 6.25 kilometer resolution, so of course you can scan Arctic wide, but you lose detail. You don't need sunlight for this guy, and it can penetrate clouds. Okay, so if you combine, so as the water is warming the ice, you can merge all the channels for the best results, right? So you merge them in both in space and in time. You get images from the three sensors and merge them to try to get a high resolution picture of what the ice is doing. So you have no gaps in the data, um, et cetera. And, you know, I asked, okay, so when are we gonna lose the ocean? When are we gonna have this so-called so blue ocean event? You know, and the answer was basically this century, you know, 2040, 2050, 2060, and I, you know, I said, well, you know, it looks like 2020 is, is in the cards. It's very possible, especially if you, you know, look at, look at, just follow the trend. And they, and I mentioned Peter Wadhams and, you know, uh, it was, uh, the speaker said, well, that's a bit of an outlier. You know, he's, uh, he's on, 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 he's an outlier in terms of, his, in terms of the view that we'll lose the sea ice. So anyway, let's see how many people come on board as, as we get closer to 2020. We'll see. Um, so we're seeing also st definite structural changes over the last four decades in the sea ice structure. So the geometry of the ice, the size of the leads, the shape and the flow patterns, the ridges, the uh, leads, uh, the flows, the, the motion, swirling motions of the ice, those things are all changing. Um, no surprise there because the ice is a lot thinner. So there's a Landsat archive, 1972 to the present, optical infrared, where we can look at it. Um, okay, so there's, uh, there, there, there's, there's, also, there's also interesting, um, the, during the Cold War, the US had sensors that were looking for infrared signatures of missiles coming across the Arctic. Um, so there's some data um, in those bands, and we might be able to extract some some sea ice data from those, and that would go back. Uh, that that would go back if we could get that data. It would be it would be nice. Um, you know, it was all classified, but you know, it's just one wavelength. But there is some stuff you can tell about the ice from that. Um, so different features are are looked at for the ice, uh, like the fraction of leads, um, the 
how how rough the ice edge is, so oiler numbers and things like that, the number of um, cracks and things in the ice, all these different statistical things. Um, so so this study, uh, there's a study that looked at the melt pond fraction. So high resolution data and medium resolution data was combined to look at the melt pond fraction. So the combination, how much snow is there on top of the ice? So dark ice versus thin ice, ponded ice. So if there's ice ponds on top, what about submerged ice? If there's ice submerged, can we detect it as ice as a part as opposed to open water? Um, so there's a NASA ice bridge um, work. There's aerial aerial uh, photography being done, uh, red, green, blue uh, aerial photography, um, panchromatic, multispectral sensors, and that's trying to get the ice fractions. Also, world view um, has a very, has a high resolution. You can get overall, uh, but your overall um, view is limited. Okay, 0.5 meter resolution according to this on Worldview. Some people have, are familiar and have been using Worldview. MODIS is the whole Arctic. Um, so, and the MODIS is great for looking, seeing, you know, where is water, where is ice, where is ponds on top of the ice. So ice underneath, but, but water, because you need to separate that. Um, so it's looking in different um, bands. Um, there's a there's a couple there's a band in the infrared there's a, a visible band a couple visible bands and you can get the different ponding ratios and things like that um, then there's the Cirrus satellite and it, it's oh it's infrared um, it's trying to detect you know the Cirrus remember a while ago I talked about um, the whole the reflectivity of the whole Arctic used to be fifty two percent. A few decades ago and now the albedo or reflectivity is 48 percent so the whole arctic is darker that was uh that was basically sears uh satellite data so there was some stuff on that um there was stuff on the new geos um 16 um satellite and some bands on that and that's studying sort of hudson's bay as a study area because it doesn't extend up to the arctic but it's studying the ice on hudson's bay and then trying to relate that to changes in the ice in the arctic so you know really to separate the water from the ice and, and from clouds in that case um and i mentioned the uh, missile warning data for potential sea ice charting um, that's also being looked at. Also, there's, uh, you know, there's civil, commercial, and military maritime data. So if you combine all these data sources, you can actually get, you know, a nice picture on what's going on with the ice. Now, in a previous video, I talked about the collapse of the Beaufort High in the winter of 2017. So this is very important. So we had, you know, the, the normal anticyclonic sea, um, the normal uh, highs so we get anticyclonic Beaufort Gyre and over a Beaufort High and then the transpolar drift and the pressure that boat that high pressure is vanishing and we're getting ice going the other way. So the anticyclonic was driving ice out the fram. Ice the other go, when the when the when the pattern is the other way, we don't get so much ice going out the fram. So in tw late in, in twenty sixteen, in the fall, October, November, December and also in 2017, the winter, January, February, March, the, um, we exceeded a two sigma change from the, the Beaufort gyre. If you compare what happened to the climatology or the long-term average, there was no Beaufort high. So we had cyclonic flow instead of the anti-cyclonic flow. This was unprecedented according to the, the article. And there was a trough, one of these jet stream troughs extended far into the West Arctic. Um, so it brought in cyclonic flow instead of the anti-cyclonic flow. Like I said, it was a two sigma event. We had the lowest pressure in the West Arctic since 1979, highest easterly flow. Fall of 2016 was super warm, record low ice growth, both in extent and thickness. It allowed for surface heating, thermal low in the region. So, so the Beaufort gyre was collapsed. So there was a track of storms running up the Barents Sea to the West Arctic, carrying heat. Um, and, and there was also variation in the Icelandic low and the Lufetten low, which is off Norway. 
So these are very significant events, and we got huge uh, impact on reduced ice growth.